Uh, good morning, it's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senya Booksellers. And this is a, another one of those um, uh, programs uh, online that I uh, produce each week uh, for world history uh, with me or live on Facebook. And then these get transferred as well to other platforms. Now, I'm very happy to say that uh, this week I've been fighting a bit of a cold. You know, the way you do it is chicken soup, <laughs> lemon uh, lemon tea and good food, uh, you know, and just keep trying. And welcome to Curtis, our Tolman. Now, this morning, uh, you know, I'm in a reflective mood in the sense that um, I've been doing uh, this world history for quite a while, and this has led me to also make a couple of moves uh, to get myself a smart TV uh, so that I can watch some of the series, the historical series, which, which you know, are based on history, but, of course, there is that element of uh, production for human consumption on, on the media. Uh, welcome to Assunda Lombardia. Uh, and I've been watching the Vikings, the series. It's a big, it's a long series, really. You can watch cut two or three uh, episodes at a time. And there are, I don't know, six, seven uh, series with many, many episodes per each one. And it gives you the idea that how the world is actually uh, comes together in historically speaking uh, from the men from the north the the northern the northmen what they call them the people who believed in many gods uh, to thor and uh, uh, you know uh, the, the ones the, the king the, the gods of the vikings and the christianity that had dominated uh, you know all of uh, uh, the Mediterranean uh, lands uh, right across for, to the east and uh, all of it to the north. Uh, and you got this push then eventually from the north people coming down to discover for themselves, you know, places like England, Wessex, you know, places like um, uh, like France, the northern part of France, and then more ambitiously they you know, slowly they make their way to Spain and to the Mediterranean. In other words, uh, both invading, uh, if the, the, the invasions that occurred created a lot of havoc uh, amongst the local populations who were r relatively living in peace because uh, the, the fighting, uh, the Roman Empire collapsed and, uh, and the feudal system sort of uh, took over in Europe. Now, I'm going to stop there because I really want to talk about what happens here uh, now from the Roman Empire. Now, we're going to talk about today about Christianity and the Eastern and Western Empire. So the after Caesar and Augustus uh, became emperor, for 300 years, uh, uh, Rome dominated all of its lands, basically, and uh, they imposed, they had, they were very good with their armies and they imposed taxes on the locals uh, right across the empire. So you can imagine the amount of money that Rome was uh, receiving from all its colonies, if you like. So, it, you know, history teaches us that uh, humans have been a very rough lot, uh, killing each other if there's, you know, the belief are different, uh, if the customs are different, the way you dress is different, all those things there come to play. The prejudices that we develop uh, in particular societies and the only time that we really achieve freedom is when we think that diversity is here with us and therefore diversity needs to be respected regardless of what it is, whether, you know, we made a lot of progress in Australia with the, uh, the NDIS uh, being supported by the government and, uh, uh, you know, all people of all religions, races, um, uh, background, whatever, uh, are accepted in Australia. But within 
ourselves, we know that there are differences. So therefore, some people accept the differences better than others. So the idea of studying history is for us to open our eyes to the rest of the world apart from our own uh, local cultural bubble, basically. Okay, so Christianity, Eastern and Western Empire. Then I'm going to do going back to China again, and also I'll read something about the Aztecs. I'm very ambitious now. I want to do. I want to fit in a lot in in an hour, and uh, I urge you to come on uh, because um, each week gives me a, a bit of a kick when people actually uh, watch what I'm doing uh, at the time that I'm doing it uh, because it's all. Uh, I didn't listen to it myself because I don't, uh, I don't I prepare the material, but whatever I say, it's ad hoc. It's what I say. So uh, sometimes when I look back, uh, welcome to Benny Lachura. When I look back to my podcast and I can see the mistakes that I've made, it's okay because you can fix them up. And I'm the one uh, who's more critical of me than anyone else. Uh, so uh, that's that's the way I sort of work, but you do I do make a lot of mistakes because I don't have all the facts all the time. I tried my best, but that's all. So I urge you to do the same. Don't worry about your mistakes. You just keep going and um, enjoy your work. Now I'll also be doing before the invasion. Uh, I continue with that, and uh, and then I also want to do the colonials by reading about Banja Patterson and Henry Lawson now and also the Italian clubs here in Melbourne, and I will add some of my travels footage from overseas. I did uh, the Mornington Peninsula, and that gave me the idea to also show some of the other material that I have. So, on that note, it's 11.31, let me start, okay? Before I do, of course, cheers. Okay. Christianity, Eastern and Western Empire. If the owner of a British villa, because the Romans had gone to England, and this book is about, of course, you know, uh, written by uh, English, you know, English history people. Everyone has got a, their own focus. If we now read Italian books from uh, Italian authors, etc., Okay, if the owner of this British villa had travelled 3,000 or more miles to the diametrically most distant part of the empire, he would have come to the province of Judea, as the Romans called Palestine. Yeah? Romans called Palestine and Judea. <laughs> What's new? Safety and ease of travel. Incidentally, it is worth remembering that his journey would probably have been accomplished a great deal more rapidly, safely and comfortably than was possible at any time after the fall of Rome until only three or four hundred years ago. So the Romans had good roads, had good, but when, when Roman, uh, the Roman Empire fell, the dominant uh, governing bodies of Rome fell. The, uh, all it took another thousand years to get back to where uh, humanity was at the time in terms of safety of travel. Because they were pretty tough, the Romans, if you did something wrong. Okay. Even today, if our traveller went by land, he would have a dozen or so sets of coinage to deal with instead of one. European Union, you know, the Euro, that's again going back to Rome because during the Roman Empire there was only one type of money. But we have now world money, it's, it's the dollar, but it's being challenged now by uh, by the, the Chinese, the Russians, everyone wants to know. They've understood how uh, America has been uh, doing things and they want to do the same. Instead of one, as, and as many languages instead of two. The people spoke their own language and Latin then. Such were some of the benefits that Roman law and order and Roman roads gave to the world. So law and order, road infrastructure, okay, and, and uh, of course, you know, of course the uh, safety for the individual who travelled. Well, not 
you know, not to the extent that we, we think they did, but that's what the book says. Now, Christianity was founded. So the Christians were the uh, were the, the, the lower the lowest type of people you could have in a multi uh, in a society that believed in many gods. And this this one here came up with the idea of the Trinity, of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So Christianity was founded in the remote province of Judea. During the reign of Augustus, Jesus Christ had been born. And from it, his disciples travelled through the world preaching Christianity. So Jesus Christ didn't do it all himself. It's what other people believed in him. It's a bit like now, you know, I'm doing this history. If people follow me uh, in doing this work. They appreciate me. They will share my work. They will support me, etc., etc. And then the idea is not to for, for the person who listens to me, but the, to then retain that inspiration and proceed on your own and says, oh, yeah, Tom Adula did the Roman Empire. I'm going to talk about this to my family, this and that. And if you happen to mention my name at the time, well, you give me uh, recognition. That's what Christ got. He got recognition for, uh, for his philosophies, for the way people should behave towards each other. And if you know, you read some of the, what he said, uh, they've been codified into, uh, into religious practices. So that's how it was. Okay, so these disciples travelled throughout the world preaching Christianity. Now, the world was a very safe one with precise laws, etc., and they were the people. They didn't have any power, the Christians. And in fact, the governors of uh, the emperors or the governors of, of Rome uh, thought that they were usurping uh, the culture of the Romans as they knew it. And therefore, they put them to, in the, you know, in the, in the Colosseum. They fed them to the lions. They crucified them on the roads. They burned them. They did all sorts of things. At first, the the emperors were not were, were not alarmed. At first, it's oh, you know, they just, you know, it's just one of those things. You know, don't worry about it. They just poor. Uh, we got the power, power. We got the power. So they didn't worry about them at all. But in time, as the numbers grew, then they saw exactly what was happening. Roman religion. The Romans, like the Greeks, had a great many gods of their own. And in the days of the empire, many Romans also worshipped eastern deities like the Egyptian goddess Isis, who had a temple in Rome itself. Now, in Rome, if you go to Rome today, there are also temples there, and there's also a mosque, and there's a... You know, all religions are represented, but of course the the dominant one is the Catholic religion, the Christian religion, and sort of, you know, uh, there are many branches of Christian religion, uh, but it's it, it's the same thing really, deep down. It's all the belief in the in the threefold God, and the Muslim comes along and says, no, 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 not three, just one, no, nothing, it's just a prophet Christ. Okay, from the time of Augustus, it had also become the custom to declare the empress divine. So they made the king, who got divine, the divine uh, accession uh, was based on this, uh, the idea that the, the, the king, the emperor, and his family were of divine, divine descendants. God put them there to rule over the people. Whatever they said went. Uh, and to in order to for that to secure the 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 power, they had a very good army and a very good bureaucracy, in which they paid for. As far as the Roman government was concerned, citizens could worship any gods they liked or none, provided only that they paid their formal respects to the reigning god, the emperor. But this, of course, the Christians could not conscientiously do. So when a Christian was brought in front of the emperor, says, who do you believe in, Christ or the emperor? He says, well, we don't believe in the emperor, we believe in Christ. Bang, 
head chopped off. Christianity attracts the poor. What's the strength of uh, any cause is the poor. Some emperors felt too that Christianity was dangerous because with its hope of happiness in a future life, it appealed particularly to the slaves and the poorer classes to whom life in this world offered little but misery and they were very badly treated. There were no uh, social uh, systems. They depended very much on their owners, the slaves. If the owner was a good one, they had lived a fairly good life, but if it was a bad one, they would be punished. Uh, they would live in fear every single day. Now, Christianity strengthened by persecutions. So the more you persecute others, the more you, if you got the numbers, the more that cause becomes strong. For these reasons and others, the early Christians were persecuted uh, savagely by a number of emperors, including Nero. And uh, by the way, I've, I've watched on Netflix, been lucky, I watched the Roman Empire. It's there as a series, you can look at it. Good, good entertainment. Uh, rather than just all the time, news, 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 or sports, sports, sport. Do some history as well. Possibly the worst monarch who ever lived in any age or country. He burned part of Rome because, and he, he sang whilst it was burning. You have all heard how Christians' martyrs were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum to make sport for the Roman crowds. However, these cruelties did not have the desired effect. Many people began to think that men and women who died so bravely for their, belie for their beliefs must have something much more worthwhile believing in that the old gods such as Jupiter, Juno, Mars and Venus. That's where we get the days of the week and we still have them. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday in English, but in Italian it's lunedì, martedì, mercoledì, very much still. They come from, you know, they come from the old Roman gods. Constantine converted. Now, King Constantine uh, was fighting the, the barbarians who came from the Northmen and uh, the Visigoths. And all, all of those tribes from the north were coming down. Well, you know, the emperor, if you've got uh, a good system, then people who are outside of the system want to be part of it as well or want to attack you and take, you know, the riches that you created. And so that's what um, Constantine was doing, was fighting. And he was fighting a particular bad lot when he saw a cross in the sky and he won the battle. And he said, from now on, Christianity is it for me. I'm overdoing it. Okay. The new faith gradually became more and more widespread and respectable until 335 AD after Dominus. Okay, the emperor himself, Constantine, became a Christian. He became a Christian, changed the laws. Christianity became the dominant religion of the state with all the powers. And you can, you can tell the destruction that that followed. They became, the Christians became very arrogant uh, after that, slowly but surely. When you acquire power, corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So they got rid of, you know, a lot of, a lot of the traditions and, of the Romans. That's it. Next week we'll do... We'll, we'll look at the Eastern, uh, the Roman Empire under Constantine became split in two, East and West. Okay, so that's that for Rome, for uh, Christianity, etc. Now, let's go to, uh, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to give, I'm just going to go to first to the Aztecs in uh, Central America. The Aztec Empire was located in central Mexico. It ruled much of the region from the, 1400, from the 1400s until the Spanish arrived in 1519. 
Huh? The Aztec. Much of the Aztec society centered around their religion and gods. They built large pyramids as temples to their gods and went to war to capture people they could sacrifice to their gods. Pretty rough lot, the Aztecs. And they started a couple of thousand years before, uh, you know, these areas here were, um, you know, had quite a lot of people in northern, uh, in Central America and the north part of South, South America and, of course, the North America as well. The capital city of the Aztec Empire was Tenochtitlan. This was founded in 1325 on an island in Lake Texcoco. At the height of its power, the city like had a population of 200,000 people as the centre of the city was a large temple complex with pyramids and a palace for the king. The rest of the city was planned out in a, a grid-like fashion and divided into district, districts. It had, it had causeways built to get to the mainland and aqueducts to bring fresh water in the city. Now, the problem with what I've just done is that I, uh, this comes a thousand years after. So the Aztecs may become later, uh, but, you know, then we've got the Incas and the Maya people. Now, the Maya people were uh, the old ones there. So, uh, you know, the, I have to look into uh, the time frame. The time frame. And I... But I have here a time frame like the Romans at the same time in China. In China, the Daze Xian uprising. In 210 BC, now we're talking same time as the Romans. What happens in China? Don't forget China is protected from all the, the rest of the world from the mountains, uh, the Tibet mountains, etc., and the desert to the north and the Mongo Mongolian steppes further north. You know, they're pretty isolated. They have to make an effort to get out. So the rulers have always concentrated uh, their, their efforts around the ge geographical areas of China. So that's why we don't talk about them so much because, you know, history is also local. So in 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang died during an inspection tour. His second son, Hu Hai, succeeded to the throne. He was so cruel that the people were in enmity and the society was in, a, in turmoil. Again, he wasn't a good ruler, this Hu Hai, the sons. For some reason, the sons of very powerful people don't often turn out to be good. They're bad. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know what it is, but there are more examples of bad uh, people who succeed their fathers than good ones. In 209 BC, over 900 poor peasants drafted to guard the boundaries were, delay, were delayed by rain in Dazexiang, southeast of today's Suzhou in Hanhui province, on their way to the posts. So 900 poor peasants drafted to look after the war. You were isolated on the war. According to the harsh Qin laws, they faced the death penalty and in desperation led by Chen Sheng and Wu Guang, they killed the officers escorting them and rose in revolt. This was the beginning of the first great peasant uprising in the unified China, just like what happened in, uh, in Russia with um, you know, uh, with the R Russian Revolution. That's again, it's a, you know, th this study of history is driving me to study Russian history. Welcome to Anna Paola. So, in order to convince the people of heavenly determination on their rebellion, they had a piece of silk on which three characters, King Chen Sheng, were written, but put into the belly of a fish, a frontier guard bought the fish, discovering the silk, and was greatly surprised. They also had people imitate animals to cry, Dachu flourishes, King Chen Sheng, to make people more astounded. <coughs> <coughs> Chen Sheng, impassioned with the remark, yeah. 
Are all the kings and nobles born naturally? The first great peasant uprising broke out in the in Da Zhejiang. The peasant army soon conquered several nearby counties in not more than a month. The army expanded into tens of thousands. Chen Sheng proclaimed himself emperor in Chen Dai, today's Huayang, Henan province. In the name of the state, Zhang Chu, the army marched westwards and moved in Hangu Guan Pass in September. When approached the capital of Qin, Xianyang, the army expended several hundred thousand. There you are, the revolution feeds on itself. The second emperor was afraid of their revolt when he learned the army was almost at the gate. It was so urgent that he had to dispatch Deng Han to defeat the main force by leading several hundred thousands of people who were constructing the, the Lishan tombs at the moment. Soon, Wu, Wu Guang was killed by one of the soldiers. Chen Sheng was also assassinated by treachery. Although the, the rebel army was in war for almost half a year, it was finally suppressed. So... Both, uh, you know, the, the 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 generals, if you like, they died, and that was it. The Dark Jade's Young Uprising. This one, the first uprising uh, of peasants in in history. But you know, in Roman history too, there was a, there are the slaves. Um, a couple of the slaves also uh, objected to being slaves at one stage, and there. Are, you know, this is the interesting part about history. You start learning about the rest of the world. And honestly, it's, it's a worthwhile pastime. So, here we go. Now, two children of Tasmania. Let me see. I'll put some... Here we are. See, just the cough just comes on a little bit, and then you have a bit of water. Then I've got my chicken soup after this. <coughs> Lemon tea, you know, lots of liquids. Okay. Two, ch two children of Tasmania. The men were getting ready to go out hunting. They squatted down, sharpening the tips of their wooden spears holding in one hand a sharp edge of rock and drawing it up the point again and again. Wuradi, who sat near his father, found a piece of stone and tried to sharpen his toy spears. He used a different method, rubbing the soft wood on the stone and rasping the tip into a blunt point. At last, the men got to their feet and walked off into the scrub. The boy followed his father. Being only 10, he had trouble keeping up, but the men didn't hurry and he kept close behind. A big roo, a big kangaroo, bounded out of a patch of trees. It raced off with the men in hot pursuit. Some let fall their spears to run faster. Others fell behind, ambered by the long spears. Wordy came last of all. Truganana watched her mother smear the, her body with grease. They were going fishing. The girl followed. Just 12, she was learning to be a good swimmer. Fastening kangaroo skin capes over their shoulders, the women took up their net bags and walked to the coastline. Some of them had a baby clinging to their shoulders under the cape. Truganana and the other big girls had to mind the younger children. She sat beside the fire, fire holding a little ba baby boy while the women climbed onto a pile of rocks. They all dived into the sea. They stayed under a long time, busily prying off the shellfish with wooden ch chisels. Finally, they surfaced with half-filled bags and came to the fire to warm themselves, tossing the oysters into the flames to cook for a snack. Then they got up to, uh, to go and get more shellfish. My God. Uh, the, the women, uh, you know, the men went after the kangaroos and the women after the shellfish. 
may I be paying a fortune to do what I did that free of charge. <laughs> Very good. Now, there's more of the children of Tasmania, but that shows you the, the division in, uh, in approach for raising uh, boys and girls in, in a Neolithic state state really in, in the villages you know the nomadic neolithic they they settled into an area and they moved from one place to another at the same time when things weren't available in one area and they thought you know there's more on the other side they would just shift their camps so that's the two the children of before the invasion before captain arthur philip and now we got to the colonials now, the colonials, they make pretty good too. Uh, they also changed Australia to, to the way we know it today. So they can't really be eliminated, if you know what I mean. Even though they, they were cruel, there was cruelty, etc. But that's cruelty is part of history. Except when it happens to you. It's tough. A Bushman's Song by Banjo Patterson. <coughs> I'm travelling down to Castle Ray and I'm a station hand. I'm handy with the rope and pole. I'm handy with the brand. And I can ride a rowdy colt or swing the axe all day, but there's no demand for a station hand along the Castle Ray. So it's shift, boys, shift. For there isn't the slightest doubt that we've got to make a shift to the stations further out. <clears throat> With the pack horse running after, for he follows like a dog, we must strike across the country and the old jig jog. So the bushmen had two horses, one for themselves, one for, uh, for the goods that they had to carry. This old black horse I'm riding, if you'll notice what this brand, he wears the crooked R you see, none better in the land. It takes a lot of beating, and the other day we tried, for a bit of joke with a racing blog for 20 pounds a side. It was shift, boys, shift, for there wasn't the slightest doubt that I had to make him shift, for the money was nearly out. But he cantered home a winner with the other one at the flog. <clears throat> He's a red hot sort of pick up with his old jig jog. I asked a cove for shearing once along the Martha guy. We shear non union here, he says he. I call it scab, says I. I looked along the shearing floor before I turned to go. There were eight or ten dashed Chinamen a shearing in a row. The Chinese were here during the gold rushes of Australia and were quite a force until uh, the, the Federation of Australia, which outlawed, you know, Australia became a white man's, a white man's country. So they shifted them all out. So there was a lot more. Uh, diversity before 1900 in Australia. It was shift, boy, shift, for there wasn't the slightest doubt it was time to make a shift with the leprosy about. So I settled up my horse and I wished, whistled to my dog and I left this scabby station at the old jig jog. I went to Illawarra where my brother's got a farm. He has to ask his landlord's leave before he lifts his arm. <laughs> his brother was working for somebody. The landlord owns the countryside, men, women, dog and cat. They haven't the cheek to dare to speak without they, without they touch their hat. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That sort of thing. It was shift, boy, shift, and for there wasn't the slightest doubt, the little landlord God and I would soon have fallen out. Was I to touch my hat to him? Was I his blooming dog? So I makes for up the country at the old jig jog. But it's time that I wasn't moving 
I have a mighty way to go till I drink a Titian water from a thousand feet below. That's in, uh, in the centre. There's a lot of Titian water in the centre of Australia and you have to go a thousand metres below. You know, the, 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 some, sometimes the, the, the water comes up. Till I meet the overlanders with the cattle coming down and I work a while till I make a pile, then, I, then have a spree in town. So, you know, he worked for the cattle people uh, from the north. They bring the cattle down because there's plenty of land, no one there. And so they can do whatever they want. So I shift, boy, shift, for there isn't the slightest doubt. We've got to make a shift to the stations further out. The pack horse runs behind us, for he follows like a dog, and we cross a lot of country at the old jig job. That's a, a Bushman song. I can't sing it, of course, not today anyway. Good one. Another good one. Let me put a, a little piece of paper here. That's it. So we're going next time. Now, this is Henry Lawson. I don't know whether you've heard of it, but one of his stories is the drover's wife. Okay, the drover had a uh, wife and three children in left because he had to follow the cattle. And she was left on her own in the middle of nowhere with children and there is a snake that comes into the, uh, into the house. And uh, the younger boy, 11-year-old, Want to kill it <coughs> with a, a stick. The, younger, the youngster comes reluctantly carrying a stick bigger than himself, then he yells triumphantly. <coughs> there it goes under the house and darts away with club uplifted. <coughs> At the same time, the big black yellow-eyed dog of all breeds who has shown the wildest interest in the proceedings breaks his chain and rushes after that snake. It's a moment late, however, and his nose reaches the crack in the slabs just at the end of its tail disappears. <coughs> Almost at the same moment, the boys' club comes down and skins the aforesaid nose. Alligator takes small notice of this and proceeds to undermine the building, but is subdued after struggle and chained up. They cannot afford to lose him. So a dog chases the snake, but I think the, the dog, they chained the dog so that he wouldn't get hurt. The driver's wife makes the children stand together near the doghouse while she watches her for the snake. She gets two small dishes of milk and sets them down near the water to tempt it to come out. But an hour goes by and it does not show itself. So she gave him milk to the snake to come out so it could kill it. Okay. I'm not going to do much more uh, of this today because... Uh, you know, this, I just want to present a little bit from the driver's wife. And uh, I'll take a note. Uh, I'll proceed next week with this. And uh, I will announce that uh, in, um, you know, from the 3rd of July till the 23rd of July, I will not be doing, uh, I'm taking a break from the reading uh, from my obligations uh, with uh, the world history. And I'll come back after uh, after that. Okay, a couple of weeks will be well, be good. I've been at it now since September last year, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's time for me to take a break too. So today is the uh, is the is the twenty third of June. So next week will be the last um, of my readings before uh, before I take time off, and then I'll proceed. I'll come back in late. Uh, I think in the last week of July. So we'll, we'll see then. Okay. So basically, that's it. Next week, come in big, you know, big numbers. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your patience uh, for uh, for Henry Lawson. And now it's for me time to stop talking and start showing what I have experienced in the clubs, Italian clubs. Uh, and there was one 
uh, you know, because I finished last week, I finished uh, my, well, let me, let me go here. Uh, what, I, what I did uh, on the Mornington Peninsula, and uh, uh, now it's time for, uh, to take a little, uh, this is going to be really interesting, I think. Yes. Ah, oh, what have I done here? Let me see, let me see. Okay, we we'll go back. Ah, oh, yes. And we've got all photos, yes. Here we go. Now, I went to, uh, I went to Solarino Social Club. And I had a very good time, and it was a, a grand night, because uh, there, there are a few bands. One of them is called No Limits. Uh, you know, very good musicians, and they entertained uh, the you know people who go to the dinner dances very well indeed, and also uh, to uh, the Balolish, what they call. But this one here, I asked Angela to come along with me, and I'm going to start. I'm going to start with her talking about going there, because this is what, this is, um, I'll do this first, I'll go to this, here, there we are, that's Italia, okay, then I got here, and that's Sicilia, so, Solarino Social Club is here, close uh, to here, there, Catania, Siracusa, there, and around that area here. Okay, there. Okay, and each one, and the Sicilians in in Melbourne have got many clubs, and they're all very proud to host their local communities. But Solarino, you know, everyone is welcomed, of course, and it's great to to go there. So Santo Gervasi <coughs> rings me up and says. Tom, are you coming? <laughs> and I say, okay, okay, I'll I'll come, okay. So, so I go and pick up Angela and say, Angela, are you going to come with me? And let's let's go and have a look at what goes on. Here we are. Here we go. A little bit. Well, yeah, for another Solarino dinner dance. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and I'm sure that Santa Gervais will be very happy. Oh, yes, there's a lot of people going too, yes. Yeah, things have moved, haven't they? Yes, I have. Yeah, okay, well, let's enjoy it, huh? Okay, bye. <laughs> okay, so, that goes, that's what we get when we get there. It's, uh, you know, the, the presents and all that. And there are a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm just going to go as I, as I go along on the night. There are a lot of um, beautiful uh, tapestries there about Sicilia. Okay, here they are. Limoncello, very famous. Uh, the Sicilians are very famous for their limoncello. Lemon uh, liqueur, beautiful. After dinner or even before. It's more, uh, and also they're very good with their artwork. And th this was adorning the, the place. So this is the place. What a lovely place. And very lucky I've shown you that and that. But there's more. Oh, yeah. There's the little towns. You know, each one makes a different, uh, there you are, different uh, places. So let's go. Messina, Catania, Siracusa, Gela, Agrigento, Serinonte, Marsala, Trapani, Palermo, Cefalù, Tindari. That's where Marsala is. I thought Marsala was up here somewhere. Oh, well, never mind. There must be a couple of Marsalas around. <laughs> now, that's the other side, you know. And this is the costume. So uh, they also, uh, the committee members, also have costumes, uh, Sicilian costumes. They're beautiful, aren't they? Grand occasions. You want to address like that every day, but for a grand occasion, it's okay. And that's one of the friends. I thought, what about me? I said, okay, wh wh whatever. So, what about you? Yes, yes, of course. And I had to put myself in it, of course. Why not? Otherwise, and uh, <laughs> Nucha there uh, um, is there. This, 
the Ra, that's the secretary, very active in the club. Okay. Now, these are the olives that go with the impanate, uh, impanate, cacciate, whatever you want to call them. And that's the band, all ready to go. And this is one of the people at my table. And that's uh, Nucha's husband there. And there's uh, another friend here with Angela. <coughs> I'll take a few there. There's Santa Gervasi. And let's see what he has to say. This is the president. <laughs> Se resta qualcuno, I, you know, because the scacciate are very, very nice and they do such a good job too. So when next time he's around, uh, it's time. Let's go on. These are some of the other people in there uh, that uh, part of, uh, you know, here we are. There you are. That was a quick one. The gentleman there, the, the uh, one is... Uh, this one here is Sandro Lemigrante, uh, this one here, uh, famous, co uh, you know, well-known comic in the Italian community. Okay. And, of course, I always have to have a picture. I thought, yeah, this one a good one. That's Ross Talarico the, from the band. Uh, I met them, you know, I thought at the beginning of the night. There you are with a the comic there. A good time. That Joe he, he's a very good singer, very good. And that's it's quite a character too. So that's where you are. And that's a nice one. Of course, lemons on the table. And two other gentlemen there across, all the tables all set up, ready to go. That's the scacciata. Okay, scacciata or impanata. Here we go. And, that, and they put the olives there. Very nice together. And it's another one of friends. That's No Limits is the band. It's called No Limits. And here we go, I think. We get to the music side. And I think this is it, isn't it? Let me have a look. Oop. Uh, no, it's the next one. Okay. Entertainment.
Welcome to Lyle, Lyle Allen. Good to see you. Wasn't that beautiful, huh? That was, that was a magnificent. It's very good, nice to see good music played. It's just wonderful. I don't know about this one here. Let's have a look what, what we've got now in store. Look at these people, huh? I will get up to dance. Hi Angela, good to see you on.
I was mesmerized when I started when I started playing this. I was just and I stayed on a little bit longer than I should have on me. But these musicians are fantastic, really and truly. They're great entertainers and uh, very lucky to have them here in Melbourne uh, playing for Italian clubs. Now, <clears throat> the next lot after this, of course, after this is, you know, uh, after a bit of a play, then they start uh, serving. And I sh showed you the empanata before. This one here is the main course. Uh, uh, well, there was um, also a plate of um, pasta with cheche, with, with chickpeas. And uh, of course, I didn't. <laughs> Sometimes I miss out. And this was a nice salad here with oranges and uh, uh, lemons. Beautiful. Very nice. More. And then after the dinner, of course, it's, uh, and, and it alternates. It, the alternation uh, is eating, conversing amongst ourselves, and then the music starts again. Here we go. And George sings first, and then Tony. <laughs> How wonderful, huh? And now we got to Tony because he sings the next one and it's a good one as well. Uh, what have I done here? Maybe it's the next one. After this, well, let me have a look. No? Yes, there was that one there. Okay, go back, Tom. That's the way to do it. Okay, let's have a look. No? Sorry, I have to do something. I have to do something because sometimes this gives me grief. What, what is it? That one there? This one here should play. Well done. Uh, sometimes the, <clears throat> the, the computer uh, takes a bit of time to bring uh, the bit up. Now, I don't know what to do now, but I suppose I can just go on. No? Well, we missed out this one. I'll have to work on it later because there's a delay in uh, in coming in bringing up the uh, the song. So never mind. Okay, let's let's do now. The next one is here. Uh, this gentleman here is called Paul Failla, and there was a gen a gentleman from Italy, from Sicily, 
from Solarino who came here to uh, to Australia for you know for his own but from Solarino it was nice to to have someone from the original town coming to Australia and seeing how the community here from that town and also everyone else actually uh, works you know how we enjoy ourselves here and Paul gave him uh, an Aboriginal uh, cup that he made and a CD. He's into Aboriginal history and entertainment, a real estate agent, quite a character. And also involved in local politics for many years. So that's, that's it there, okay? And uh, does he say something? Yes. <laughs> That's a nice interlude for the evening. As you can see, a bit of recognition doesn't go astray. It was good. And uh, uh, I'm going to try. Uh, I'm going to try that one again. Let me see. If it comes up, uh, let me see. No, it's still giving me grief. Okay. Don't worry about it, Tom. Keep going to the next one. All right. Now, this one here. Yes, we've got... Music here. Yeah? Okay, here we go. Cuando caliente el sol es en Spanish. Oh! 
this was a nice, uh, you know, I love that uh, Quando Caliente del Sol. It's been a favourite in the Italian clubs and at weddings for many, many years. Now, what do I have here? I have here a few more, but I will continue next week with uh, Solarino Social Club and the next uh, lot next week should be a lot of fun uh, because there's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit the next week. Uh, but what I wanted to show you though, I wanted to show you something else from uh, 20, 2018. I was in Italy at the time, uh, but before I went to Italy, I was here, we went to uh, a place here in Bendigo, uh, in the Sovereign Hill, actually. Let me see if I can, yes, here we are, with uh, Filippo Castrignano and his daughter. That's Filippo, he lives in Monopoly. And we went there, here. That's, uh, and we'll continue the journey towards Bendigo. And I thought, <laughs> I thought Bendigo, Ballarat. <laughs> I always said Bendigo, but it was Ballarat, Ballarat. And that's uh, Maria Luisa, <clears throat> of course. And uh, you know, I went uh, with Maria Luisa and her father around Italy as well. Great. Okay, this was Sovereign Hill. As we got there, a bit of local history. You know what I mean. We need that. Badly. Mine tours. Notice when we got there, it was good. That's a gentleman there. Unfortunately, that day, I remember when I, I went that day, I, uh, I had my other camera and uh, what happened was I... <laughs> what happened there was... That was nice, wasn't it? Nice picture. Uh, I, for some reason, didn't press the button, so I lost... A beautiful interview with uh, the manager. But this was the old, you know, Sovereign Hill. You visit it. That's how they used to live in the colonial days. This is the times of... Here we go. There we are. The light there, see? It's no good. Photography there. When you've got glasses. There are the anvil. Look at that. You know, for horseshoes, etc. And of course, you got the food part, you know, the good coffee. There we are. Sovereign Hill, well worthwhile visiting. Oh, I didn't focus on this. Look at that. So, that's the pies. Beautiful. Uh, well set up too in Sovereign Hill. That's outside. With Filippo. There we are. The drinks here, look at it. Nicely set up, quite a few shops. So, if you haven't been to Sovereign Hill, it's a good way, you know, good spot to go. I haven't been there for a few years now. Time for another trip, maybe. Look at that. The 19th century before the 20th, and we are in the 21st century. How time flies. Gold mine tour. That, that's the gold mine. Chickens around. More <laughs> pans, beautiful. Frying meat, cooking on the on the on the fire. There it is. 
must be tea, uh, teapots, uh, plates. That's for this one's used on the uh, maybe for looking for gold in the river. Yeah, okay. old time traveling with horses. Quite a few people on that day. Those were the times, eh? the children. <laughs> oh. I don't know what that is, but anyway, some of the, look at the stove, the cabs, pretty solidly built. And it is cold in Ballarat too, some days. Got black, oh, that is soap. You can make soap out of different type of uh, um, different type of products. Passion fruit, poppy seed, soap. Look at that. Natural goat's milk, black boy rose. Interesting. <laughs> Look at it. I think that looks like uh, a coffin. Maybe just a box. It's one of the old ones. Fire Brigade. Well, I'm going to stop there at the Fire Brigade and we'll continue next week. Because I've noticed it's 12.35 and I've gone over time. Uh, and here we go. Okay. See, I got involved with that. That was good. But I have covered everything today. Uh, apologies for... <clears throat> the coughing, etc. But as you can see, the minute you stop talking too much, uh, that's what happens. Everything returns to normal. Okay, on that note, thank you very much for today, for your company. And uh, now this will go on my Facebook page. You'll be able to enjoy the music, uh, you know, one after the other. And I'll check up the, the song that didn't come up. So from Tom Padula of Tom Padula TV on YouTube, don't forget on the smart TV and in senior booksellers for anything else to do with history or languages. Okay? Ciao. Au revoir. Next time. Ciao, ciao.